We are, uh, we are going to begin with our morning panel. Thank you all uh, very much uh, again for being here today. Um, we'll try to herd uh, those that are in the lobby uh, back in as well. I often think my job is herding cats uh, in public office. Not that, uh, not that that's what we're doing here today. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to move forward now with our morning panel discussion. Uh, the focus this morning is going to be on multimodal integration, freight, transit, and passenger rail. And we've got a great panel here this morning to discuss efforts at improving our region's transit rail system. Seamless integration with freight rail delivery systems and other transportation modes and how the existing rail network can successfully be integrated with the Cincinnati streetcar and other transportation projects. Our panel this morning uh, will be led and, and our speakers are going to go in the order that they appear in the program. So first up will be Paul Grether who is the manager of rail services for the Southwest Ohio Regional Transit Authority. Um, if our, our panel will forgive me, I'm not going to go into uh, everyone's bio. It's in the program and encourage people to, to read that, read all the great things about our, our distinguished panel. But in the interest of time, I'm just simply going to acknowledge who our panelists are. Uh, Paul Grether will be followed by Laura Brunner. Uh, Ms. Brunner is the president and CEO of the Port of Greater Cincinnati Development Authority. Uh, following Ms. Brunner will be Richard Dial, Senior Transportation Planner, HDR Engineering, Inc. And of course, you all heard from, uh, from Richard just a, uh, just a moment ago. And then batting cleanup in our program is Mark Polosinski, the uh, Executive Director of the Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana Regional Council of Governments. Uh, the format uh, this morning is our panelists each have prepared remarks that will be about 10 minutes each. Um, I know I announced earlier, and I'll say it again, if you would like to fill out cards, index cards with questions or comments that you may want our panelists to uh, address, please do so. When you've completed those, just raise your hand and we'll have people coming around to collect the cards. So when the panel is done then, uh, Alan Freeman, who is at my left, Alan will be uh, uh, reading through the cards and uh, Alan will be here at the podium posing questions from the cards to our panelists, and our panelists, I think, each have uh, or will make available a handheld mic, uh, and they'll be answering the questions from that point. So uh, it should be a very, uh, very interesting program this morning. Very, uh, I'm very interested to hear what everyone has to say and your questions and comments as well, and we'll have a discussion and dialogue. Ted Hubbard, the Hamilton County engineer who is listed as the fifth panelist, uh, has been called away on county engineer duties this morning. Uh, but Ted will be back for the afternoon, and uh, we're going to sub Ted in in the afternoon program, um, and he's going to have points that will be uh, both very relevant and, uh, and cogent in the afternoon that he'll be able to give. But uh, unfortunately, Engineer Hubbard has been called away this morning on, uh, on county business. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, well, share, share the joke, everyone. But <laughs> oh, he's the only cogent in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, I could, I could learn lessons from that too, I'm sure. All right, so uh, without any further from me, uh, please welcome our first panelist and speaker, the manager of rail services for Southwest Ohio Regional Transit Authority, Paul Grether. Thank you. Good morning, and as we say in the uh, transit business, welcome aboard. Um, how do I uh, access the presentation? Oh, someone's coming in. I don't want to mess with. Okay, I'll shoot. Yep, that's fine. All right, sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to do my best to keep this to the uh, 10 minutes that Commissioner Fortune uh, mentioned. But what I'd like to do is um, 
kind of talk about two different topics that are very much related. The first is talk specifically about what is probably one of the few known facts about SORTA and that we, um, we are, in addition to being the uh, bus transit agency, we are also a uh, railroad. Uh, we're actually several railroads. And um, I'm going to go through uh, a presentation on the uh, rail assets that the, the agency uh, has acquired over the years, kind of the background of that. And then talk a little bit uh, specific on the topic of the, um, the uh, meeting here today about at a very, very, very high level what some of the issues are with uh, integrating uh, freight and rail service from a regulatory point of view. So sort of uh, back in the uh, 1990s purchased uh, three sets of uh, rail rights of way, uh, which, which you see listed here. We've talked a lot about the Oasis line, um, the uh, Blue Ash North line, and then Blue Ash South. Uh, Oasis and Blue Ash North are both uh, active rail freight railroads uh, that we uh, either jointly own or have operating agreements with our strong partners in the Indiana Ohio Railroad, which is a uh, Genesee and Wyoming property. Um, and Blue Ash South is a set of um, uh, discontiguous parcels that form an abandoned right of way. Um, so, in general, uh, the relationship we have with the freight railroad is. Uh, through a joint ownership agreement. It is not a lessor lessee relationship, which is very important to understand in terms of each party, the, the Genesee, Wyoming, the Indiana Ohio Railroad, they have certain rights and sort of have certain rights. We each own different elements of the right of way, and I'll get a little bit into that uh, in a few minutes. Um, the acquisition of all three uh, railroad uh, properties was funded by the Federal Transit Administration. And so along with that come a whole bunch of strings uh, attached to the funding that was used to purchase the right-of-way and the purposes that, uh, that we can use the right-of-way for. Um, one of the, uh, the key elements to the agreements that we have with the railroads and the purchase and sale agreements is that we are fully indemnified as the transit agency for, for the operations, for the current freight operation. <laughs> And then in all the agreements, the whole point of, of, of sort of ownership of these rights of way is improvements in the future for transit, be that bus or rail. And so when, if we are to initiate passenger service, that forms a trigger point in those agreements. And then different uh, uh, roles and responsibilities are, are basically changed between SORTA and the railroad. So this, this is the map. Um, you can see the uh, red line. I don't know if I have a laser pointer here, but, but you can basically see the red line, the, the blue ash line, that's an active uh, railroad that goes from basically Norwood north to Fields Ertle Road, uh, north of which um, there's uh, some abandoned right away. And then the railroad used to continue south into downtown Cincinnati, and there's a whole series of parcels that we own, um, but unfortunately at the time, in the 90s, when sort of became aware that uh, the railroad, that Conrail at the time was selling it, they had already sold off some of the uh, pieces of the right-of-way for private development. So, but there's some key parcels there that could be used for some type of future uh, transit investment. And then leaving the central business district to the east, you can see the blue line that kind of uh, loops around towards Lunkin Airport, swings north, goes through Norwood, and then goes out to Evendale. Uh, that's the Oasis line. And uh, the portion of it basically from downtown from the Montgomery and Boathouse uh, to Lunkin Airport and north to Fairfax is uh, a major part of uh, the Oasis Rail Transit project. So the Oasis line specifically is 16 miles long between uh, the Boathouse and uh, Evendale. It was purchased in 94. Um, and here are the kind of those key elements. And each, each of the agreements is structured a little bit differently. In this case, we own, uh, sort of owns the right-of-way. So we own all the underlying property. Uh, we own all the structures, such as uh, bridges. Um, there are, on the portion of the line from basically the boathouse to Fairfax, there's actually two tracks, two mainline tracks. Uh, one is in service, and the track, it's the physical rail and track materials are owned by the, uh, the railroad. And then the adjacent out-of-service track, which is in um, not in serviceable condition, but it, nonetheless, that's owned by SORTA. Um, and then we receive some funding from fiber optic and billboard leases on the right-of-way, and we have the rights to those. Um, and um, we have permanent passenger rights. So these, these agreements are, are in perpetuity. They can only be amended through the mutual consent of both parties. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, there's a trigger point in there. If we initiate passenger service, we take on more responsibility for the maintenance of the railroad. Currently, the uh, Indiana Ohio maintains all the track structure. But if we were to initiate passenger service, we would take over that responsibility. We would take over dispatching responsibility. And the passenger trains would have priority over the freight trains. So just here are some pictures to give you some idea. The Oasis Line is also the only railroad we own on where there's uh, third-party trackage rights. So on the portion up here in the upper left, that photograph is in Bond Hill. Uh, Norfolk Southern has trackage rights. And so they're able to get trains to their Peavine Line, which is what operates east out of uh, Cincinnati to Portsmouth. And that was a key part of what has allowed Norfolk Southern to discontinue service on a portion of the Wasson Line because they have this alternative routing they can use uh, on the Oasis Line to access their, uh, their line to the east. Um, there's a photograph down the right is uh, near the boathouse. You can see there's three tracks. The center track is the active main line for the, uh, for the INO. The track that's got the grass growing in it, we own that and it's not used. And then to the right is just some access track to a siding. Um, and then you can see another photo on the left, uh, getting closer to Lunkin Airport. You can see the out of service sort of track on the left there. Blue Ash North um, is about 10 miles from, uh, from Norwood, which is where the uh, Indian Ohio has their uh, base in Cincinnati, where they do uh, a lot of their maintenance, they have a yard there. Uh, both the Blue Ash and the Oasis lines cross in Norwood, uh, right near the uh, facility. Uh, on this case, we, we own uh, basically uh, all the right of way, the land, and the INO owns all the track. And there's, in most cases, just one track. So, um, uh, and they have permanent uh, rights to, to the freight. Just some, uh, some photographs you can see there on the right is the uh, beginning of the line in Norwood. Uh, I think that's the bridge where it crosses over the Norwood lateral. And then just a view of what the right of way looks like. Um, Blue Ash South is uh, just some, some discontiguous parcels. Um, comes down, the line uh, actually crosses I-71. on a, If you've seen that blue bridge that um, doesn't have trains on it anymore, just as you're about to go into the tunnel on, uh, on 71, that's um, that's the, uh, the Blue Ash South line. And so there you, uh, you see some of the pictures. Track material is gone, um, and it's just basically discontinuous <coughs> pieces of right of way. Um, so now I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, shifting subjects, to what some of the regulatory issues at the, at the federal level. We heard earlier from the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, the key issue with integrating freight and passenger rail is safety and uh, making sure that in the event, that either through the primary objective, of course, is always avoiding collisions, but then in the event there's a collision that the, uh, the vehicle has, uh, met, has met all the safety requirements that uh, protect the, uh, the passengers from, uh, from collisions with freight trains. Uh, there is a whole slew of federal regulation in this regard. Um, and in addition, in the cases where the railroad, the host railroad, is not owned by the public sector, you have to come to terms with the owner of the railroad, which in the case of the Class 1 railroads, they require a tremendous amount of insurance and liability uh, indemnification. And, and they are in business to move freight. They are in business for shareholder value. And so, you know, they're not necessarily open in some cases, particularly if they have capacity constraints, to allowing uh, uh, passenger service. And I'll talk about some of the ways that, um, that the public sector can leverage the freight <coughs> railroad's interest to actually uh, accomplish uh, passenger service. So for the vehicle, for the, and, and the Commissioner Fortune talked earlier about DMUs, um, deciding how you're going to comply with the federal requirements is a critical planning issue. You either have vehicles that are just outright compliant with the federal requirements, which means you must meet all the FRA safety requirements, Federal Railroad Administration. Um, so if you've ever ridden the commuter rail in Chicago, the metro system, those are fully compliant vehicles, Amtrak fully compliant vehicles. Those can mix with freight trains uh, on the same track. Um, there are now alternate compliant vehicles. Uh, this is an emerging area in, uh, um, in the world of FRA safety regulations. The DMU from Denton County, the, the green one I think we saw a picture of earlier, that was one of the first attempts at an alternate compliant vehicle where the, the vehicle may not meet all the crash strength requirements that FRA has but um, can stop faster and has other collision avoidance technologies that allow it to meet um, the new compliance requirements. Um, and then you can just be non-compliant, but what that means is you cannot mix with freight. And so your track must be totally separated from uh, the freight rail network. 
And, and in a lot of cases, too, if you're totally non-compliant, such as the Cincinnati streetcar is a good example because it doesn't mix with freight trains, you then fall under Federal Transit Administration safety requirements, which in Ohio means that the Ohio DOT is your safety oversight. So I mentioned earlier issues not just with FRA, but also if you're on a railroad that, unlike the railroads I was talking about earlier, is owned by a for-profit freight railroad company, what are the issues there? The key thing to remember when negotiating with a uh, railroad for passenger ex access is that their focus is not on you know, providing passenger rail service for your community. The only entity really that has the right to operate passenger service on a freight railroad is Amtrak through federal uh, their enabling legislation. So even, even as a municipality, as a state, you don't, you, can, you don't have condemnation authority over a freight railroad because they have special federal status. So it's, you know, you're forced into negotiating with the freight railroad, and it has to be a partnership. Um, so the ways, and I've kind of summarized a lot of the issues here, but I think the key issue is bold-faced at the bottom. If you're going to try to gain access to um, a freight railroad for passenger service, there's, there's, there's ways to do that, and is to provide either additional capacity to fund infrastructure investments for them, which are not cheap, and they can use them for freight at night or at other times, and then you would use it for passenger during the day, or you have to buy the railroad if they're willing to sell it and if you can afford it. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, that's not the case. So, you know, there was a lot of foresight in the in the Cincinnati region back in the 90s when Conrail was divesting itself of all kinds of rail assets to purchase by sorta the, these railroad facilities using the federal money that was available at the time. Um, that's the best scenario because now we have the right to operate passenger service. But typically, uh, unless you own the railroad or unless you're willing to invest in it, it, it becomes a very difficult negotiation to introduce passenger service. But it can be done, and there's examples. Um, one of the uh, very interesting examples is in Salt Lake City, uh, the front runner service. They essentially built and negotiated with Union Pacific and built their track parallel to the UP uh, in Salt Lake City. So they have a totally separate railroad that runs parallel on the same right away. The trains don't mix. Um, they're fully FRA compliant, but they just stay out of the freight railroad's way, and the freight railroad stays out of their way. Um, and that's a really good solution if you have the right of way available to do it. Um, Philadelphia, um, on the New Jersey side, uh, operates the River Line. It is a uh, non compliant vehicle that has a waiver to compliance through what's called time based separation. So these vehicles don't meet the FRA crash worthiness standards, but the freight trains operate at certain times, then they lock the gates, and then the passenger rail trains operate during the day. Um, Capital Metro in Austin is a similar, similar situation. And then Denton County, which is an alternate compliant vehicle. So that, that vehicle, through a whole series of protracted negotiations with the Federal Railroad Administration, was deemed to be alternate compliant because it can stop very quickly. Uh, there's technology on the vehicle and in the signaling system on the railroad to avoid collisions between uh, uh, passenger trains and freight trains. So it's a very complicated and, and technical issue and it can take a long time. And so it's, my point is really that um, that needs to be taken into consideration on the front end of any discussions about integrating uh, freight and passenger. And those discussions are, are certainly ongoing with, with the Oasis Rail Transit Project. So. Uh, I think we're saving questions until the end, so we're going to introduce Laura Brunner, who's going to do the next presentation. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be here with all of you today. I want to thank the mayor and uh, Commissioner Portoon for commissioning this uh, summit today. Uh, we have a lot of important subjects that are being covered, and it's great to see such a uh, a diverse group today. Our work at the Port Authority uh, focuses on creating conditions for economic growth in Hamilton County. We work in a variety of collaborative partnerships with many of you here today and hopefully we'll continue to work with more of you in the future. Uh, we work in many different communities and continue to strengthen our understanding of all the issues that encompass growth. <coughs> Transportation is a complex and compelling issue. The port, at the Port Authority we have focused our resources on understanding the movement of freight for the past two years. Moving people efficiently and safely is also a key economic development issue. And I'm happy to say that um, I'll be uh, learning along with my um, fellow Port Authority members here today about those issues during the day. Uh, what motivated the Port Authority to focus on freight was OKI's regional freight study in 2011, 
that recommended that the port ramp up the marketing of this region's transportation assets and study ways to expand port operations. It really was a, a call to action for us. As such, collaboration between Hamilton County, OKI, the Port Authority, and private terminal operators and partners have advanced a number of initiatives over the last two years. In the area of transportation, we are assessing our competitive advantages with regard to freight transportation and deciding how to best leverage federal, state, and local resources to strengthen a global role in the low-cost transportation of goods. In 2012, we commissioned a study that included a very detailed look at freight costs and cargo opportunities. It outlined for us not only barge or waterborne cargo activity within the Port of Cincinnati boundaries, but also looked at rail and intermodal freight activity. I think some of the key um, findings of this study will help contribute to today's discussion. The entire study and an executive summary are on the Port Authority's website under our transportation tab if you would like more detail. I know I'm here today to, at a multimodal uh, transit summit, but bear with me for a bit while I talk about freight costs. Transportation for manufacturers is one of the largest cost buckets in the global supply chain. The vast majority of freight moves by a truck, but rail is a very attractive and a lower cost mode of transportation and is often the most viable alternative to the truck. It is also a greener way to move goods. So as we hear more and more about insourcing, this discussion of freight costs is an important one. Many of you may have attended the Advanced Manufacturing Summit at Siemens in Norwood yesterday and got excited about bringing manufacturing jobs back to the United States. I'm excited too because I know we are ready for that right here in our region. We have the labor force, we have a significant workforce training powerhouse with Cincinnati State and other organizations, and we have the leadership and infrastructure to make it happen. Momentum around insourcing will accelerate as the costs to manufacture overseas <coughs> grow and it becomes more advantageous to again manufacture here in the United States. Our energy costs in the United States are decreasing. Our labor rates are now more competitive. So if we focus on decreasing the cost of transportation and increasing efficiencies, this region will be very attractive for insourcing. Mayor Cranley announced yesterday a plan to gain federal designation to attract manufacturing here in Southwest Ohio. As we further lower transportation costs, we can help make the case for insourcing. Because of the cargo market study that we commissioned, we now have a better understanding of rail flows. In terms of Cincinnati area rail flow, that is the tons of freight moving in and out of the Cincinnati area, 5.8 million ton, total tons of cargo are outbound from Cincinnati, and we see 7.7 .7 million ton, tons come into Cincinnati. Steel product dominates the market, making up 60% of all rail freight, largely to and from Midwestern markets. Since 2007, as you know, the steel industry has been affected by the overall decline in the economy. However, trends in the automotive and construction markets have indicated that there are growth opportunities for steel and the related scrap throughout the Cincinnati region. An increase in domestic automotive manufacturers and parts suppliers creates a potential for rail and barge movement of steel. We're fortunate here in our market that we're tied to several large steel users, including AK Steel Middletown and global produ producer um, ArcelorMittal in Cleveland. Looking at intermodal activity, which includes rail, truck, and barge, 1.34 million tons originate in Cincinnati, with Jacksonville, Norfolk, and Los Angeles making up 50% of the freight destinations. We were interested to learn that the majority of intermodal freight coming into Cincinnati originates in Los Angeles, Norfolk, Seattle, and Jacksonville, respectively. 30% of that coming from Los Angeles, which is a lot of cross-country cross hauling. In terms of identifying growth opportunities and increased efficiencies in rail freight, we can look at both area and industry type. The opportunity to grow the steel business within the Cincinnati region lies within capturing cargo movements from the East Coast and Great Lakes ports and through the creation of new sourcing and routes for the movement of raw materials. The study also points to the potential 
of intermodal transport connected to the Gulfport region of, region of Houston and New Orleans. A landed cost analysis um, done by our consultant determined Cincinnati's competitive advantage for these cargoes. U using the consultant's model, he calculated barge, rail, and truck combined transportation costs from the ports of Houston and New Orleans to Cincinnati um, compared to Columbus, Indianapolis, and Louisville. <laughs> the results appear the most advantageous through the New Orleans ports rather than Houston based on availability and reduced transit time. Additionally, industries for commodity growth that he identified based on the transportation cost advantages were polymers, chemicals, and grains, though even the total of these is less than half of that of steel. Significant growth in distribution center activity has occurred over the last few years east of the Mississippi River and along the eastern seaboard. Cincinnati is strategically located with amenities that include the Queens Gate access to Class I rail. However, there are numerous competing regions, including Indianapolis, Louisville, Nashville, and Memphis, vying for similar distribution center and manufacturing facilities. The Jobs Ohio cluster approach includes industries that are ideal for our region based on these transportation costs that can be supported by the existing infrastructure that we have. Uh, in, a, in advanced manufacturing, Ohio is the third largest overall source for iron and steel in the United States. Ohio's leadership in this industry is supported by its strategic location within 600 miles of 60% of all U.S. and Canadian manufacturing. Uh, Jobs Ohio has uh, a focus on the polymers and plastic industry. Uh, it's a leading industry in our state. Polymer manufacturing uh, sources products from both overseas and domestic, and a significant amount of these products travel through or to Cincinnati. Ohio is home to some of the largest polymer and chemical companies in the United States. In food processing, Ohio is among the top five U.S. producers of dairy and baked goods, snacks, spices, and other food products. This means an extensive supply chain to support a flourishing concentration of companies that cultivate, process, distribute, and market foods and drinks. Ohio is in the heart of the U.S. Grain Belt, which produces 50% of the corn grown in the United States and much of the world's grain and soybeans. All, logistics, uh, all key logistics parks across the United States are built around rail. At the Port Authority, we've benchmarked a few of these uh, through visits to Rickenbacker and Kansas City so far, and we recently had the pleasure of touring the CSX yard in Queensgate, which is a massive, well-orchestrated 24-7 operation. I'll end with the recommend recommendations to us made by our consultant uh, based on this study. Uh, we were encouraged to pursue funding, working with OKI and others um, from both federal and states, uh, the federal and state, in the way of grants and, and tools, to, to create tools to develop uh, low-cost bonding for maritime and logistics projects. To drive logistic efficiencies uh, um, for the region with respect to our critical asset infrastructure, once again working with our partners at OKI. Uh, to provide advocacy for maritime and logistics related development and to promote and market our regional trans transportation assets. <coughs> And that will also lead us and in, in, in work well with our real estate development activities throughout the South Mill Creek <coughs> quarter uh, area. So we've got plenty of work to do. We've just are, are in the learning phase. And due to the complexity of this industry, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, been, a very, it's been very time consuming, but very, very interesting. So we look forward to working with all of you in the future. We have one down in the front. Another one over there. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Mark Polisinski. Mark is the uh, the president of the of OKI, the Regional Council of Governments, and uh, we will give uh, we will give Mark the floor now. Thank you.
Alan used to work for me, so I was kind of surprised he uh, shook my hand. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we were very fortunate to uh, have Alan work for us for a number of years. I too want to thank Commissioner Portune and Mayor Cranley for initiating this conference. Um, at OKI, the integration of all modes of transportation we find to be critically important to this region's ability to compete in the new global economy. Uh, and the link between rail and transit, I think, is gaining more and more importance uh, because the marketplace is deeming that link uh, to be a major contributor to a region's ability to attract and retain valuable human and financial resources. Uh, that is why this summit's important. Uh, the summit might also be important because it might signal a change in how the region views transit rail. Uh, when I came to OKI 10 years ago to be its CEO, um, the uh, simple fact was a light rail proposal had suffered a very lopsided and humiliating defeat at the polls, and passenger rail was taken off of the region's radar for a variety of political as well as economic reasons. While that was happening, uh, we at OKI, um, we got interested in freight uh, because we believe that freight movements would be the major determinant of whether or not a region could compete in the new global economy. So OKI began a deep dive into freight and the economics of freight, and the outcome, as a number of people have mentioned, has, was OKI's freight plan. I recommend the term word plan as opposed to study. It was a plan. We identified 58 projects. Uh, by improving them, we could improve the freight movements uh, around the region and thereby increase our ability to compete. Uh, I'm happy to say uh, many of the uh, vast majority of the major recommendations are already moving forward. However, as OKI began to understand freight, we also began to understand how passenger rail could be incorporated into the footprint, if you will, of freight rail. This was particularly true because of sort of being so ingrained in significant parts of that footprint. So at OKI, we don't view passenger rail as separate from freight rail. In this region, in this region, uh, those freight rails compose most of the backbone of, of what would be any passenger rail network. As we developed the freight plan, it became increasingly clear that improvements to the freight network could improve the region's ability to also move people. When it comes to the economics of rail transit, it is dependent on the freight rail infrastructure as a matter of financial efficiency. In an era where we have a meager economic recovery at best, tight federal, state, local government budgets, and growing infrastructure needs from all modes, financing any big ticket item is problematic. It's imperative that financing be cobbled together, again, in the most efficient manner. If you look at OKI's long-range plan and its needs list, we have over $1.5 billion dedicated to what we call passenger rail service. While most of that is dedicated to the Oasis line, there's still over half a billion dollars for other projects. These projects can be as small as a $2 million uh, reacquisition of um, uh, abandoned rail line, a $56 million flyover bridge that connects CSX and Genesee Wyoming lines to a $300 million build out of the Wasson line. The magnitude of these projects, coupled with the poor fiscal condition we find government in demands that we find efficient financing. As such, revamping a rail network and working with SORTA in doing that already in place is a heck of a lot cheaper than building an entire new rail backbone. If you accept the premise that existing rail lines are the most cost efficient and therefore most realistic means of building a rail transit integration, you must then agree that the railroad companies must be full partners in this integration. As Paul has indicated, they own a lot of the lines. I think this is an obvious <laughs> partnership, but it does present some different ways to look at things. Having come from the private sector, I guess I'm a little bit more interested in that difference. The railroads are not in the business of building public goods. On the other hand, government is in the business of building only public goods. 
The railroads are interested in profits and rates of return. A public good almost by definition cannot make preeminent the rate of return on a project. Railroads answer to millions of investors from all over the world. Local governments answer to voters in a very, very concentrated part, which they call their jurisdictions. And please don't chastise the railroads for their capitalistic business plan. They employ a quarter of a million people in this country and with an average salary of about $80,000. So at the same time, we know the critical importance of the partnership with railroads. Each side must understand the parameters of that partnership. I think 10 years ago, the success of such a partnership would have been suspect. But I think times have changed, and a few of those changes might be relevant to how we could better forge that partnership in this region. First, and I say this knowing that OKI communities do have issues with rail companies, but the railroads are becoming more and more aware that they are part of our cities, our villages, our counties, and our communities. I'm not saying that railroads are warm and fuzzy. I'm just saying they're not the disinterested bastards they used to be. <laughs> <coughs> Several years ago, following on this point, uh, OK, I wanted to meet with the railroad headquarter leadership of NS and CSX, and we were told by everyone that we would not get a meeting, and if we did, it would not in any way, shape, or form be substantive. Everyone was wrong. We got the meetings, we met at the headquarters, and they were outstanding because of the amount of information the railroads gave us about how this region fit its strategic plan. In addition, these meetings were valuable because the railroads went to great length to try to impress us that they knew that they had to work more closely with communities. The second, another change, uh, that's taken place, and I say this with more empirical understanding, the concept of a public-private partnership is much more accepted today than what it was 10 years ago. This is particularly true in transportation matters. We only need to look downriver at Indiana where they're building a bridge across the Ohio River using a public-private partnership. Would that we do such here in this region? Um, also using the OKI experience, OKI itself has entered into public-private partnerships with Norfolk Southern to double stack clear its line from Columbus to Cincinnati. Now when we did this a few years ago, it was noteworthy. If we were to do the same thing now, I don't think it would be remarkable in any, sh any way, shape, or form. Because time is short, I just want to leave you with two thoughts. The partnership that's going to be required uh, to make the connection between rail and transit involves more than just government and the railroads, all levels of government, transit companies for sure, financiers from around the corner to around the world, regional private sector leadership, unbiased transportation experts, unions, single interest groups, and the non-interested general public all have to be at the table when we form this partnership. The issues surrounding connectivity between freight rail and rail transit are very large and no doubt divisive to several degrees. We will not get it perfect and not everyone will put aside their personal agendas, but we have to have as many cooperating on a practical, workable, affordable solution as possible. We will never get the extreme folks from the left or from the right to be on board. So we have to work to the greater good dictated by as many rational people as possible. <laughs> the last point I want to make, and I guess enough of it has been made here, is that we have an excellent rail transit project already working its way through the awful NEPA process, and that's the Eastern Corridor. Um, news, port, news reporting aside, this project <coughs> dwarfs the Cincinnati streetcar when it comes to its impact on the 2.1 million people who live in this region and their economies. If you're not familiar with it, I urge you to do so if you have an interest in connecting rail and transit. As you learn more about the project, I'm sure you'll become a supporter of the project. And um, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning and be part of this incredibly distinguished panel. Thank you. Now, I must admit, I have
have to apologize. I went a little bit out of order, but that's what happens when you let me pinch hit. I start to take over and I change everything. So with that, our next uh, guest is, uh, guest is uh, Richard Dial. You saw him earlier today talking about some uh, regional trends, but uh, we uh, thought that he had some more information to impart to us. So here he is for the second round. Good morning again. I'll, I'll be brief. I think I took a, a few minutes more in the, in the first segment. The two issues I wanted to touch on very quickly were uh, the rail vehicle and integration with the, the existing customers operating on the lines, as, as Paul <laughs> indicated. And then secondly, just to provide an introductory uh, explanation of trans-oriented development. With regard to the vehicle, I think Paul did an excellent job of laying out uh, where the FRA's position is from a planning perspective. What we heard from the public in our earlier meetings and working very closely, particularly with regard to City of Cincinnati staff, was that the rail line runs very close to people's houses. And so we are hopeful there are regulations uh, currently being worked through at FRA that would allow for the alternately compliant vehicle as uh, is currently operating in Denton County, Texas, which uh, is the equivalent of a, a story that I was told in the, in the olden days, we all drove big Buicks and, and big vehicles that had a lot of sheet metal. And in the event of an accident, uh, the passengers went home in an ambulance and you drove the car back to the house. <laughs> Today, what we have uh, certainly operating, or the opportunity to have, is a, a more modern car. And if the, the car is involved in an accident, the people go home and the car gets towed away. And that is the situation with the, the rail vehicles that we are proposing for the Oasis Rail Service. They, uh, through a combination of high-tech materials, they're very safe, uh, they have tremendous stopping power. We're also looking at supplemental safety measures that would be implemented across the line to reduce the potential for uh, vehicle rail interactions, uh, to minimize those, as well as to introduce quiet zones so that the operator of the vehicle uh, does not have to, under ordinary circumstances, sound the horn as he or she is traveling the line. Of course, ultimately, the responsibility of the engineer uh, to sound an alert in the event of someone who has, as Richard indicated, trespassed onto the right-of-way uh, remains their obligation, and so that, that could happen. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, the vehicles that are selected for the line would be very um, easily accepted by the community, that would be safe, they would be quiet, and they would be efficient, and, and that is our, our goal in, in recommending a, a rail vehicle technology for this service. Secondly, Transit-oriented development, a lot of people hear transit-oriented development and they think it's something new, and it, it really isn't. We have so much in this society of what is auto-oriented development that that has become, uh, in many areas, the prevailing land use uh, choice. Transit-oriented development is really, it, it exists in a lot of the established neighborhoods in Cincinnati. Uh, Columbia Tusculum being again a classic example, the rail line could be introduced there. There are new uh, developments that are underway, new housing, uh, detached housing as well as some flats that would provide someone with less than a five minute walk to access the rail line and to be able to get uh, to downtown or out toward Milford or Eastgate or wherever the line ran in the future with uh, other corridors. And also, it provides an opportunity to integrate uh, rail transit into the existing neighborhoods. Now, in some of the eastern communities that are less established, newer, uh, certainly in the village of Newtown, there are some opportunities there to enhance the, the village and to continue with its, uh, its character. There are also open properties that are available, and a lot of the decisions on what is constructed out there will be based on the market but there are opportunities to integrate uh, this new transportation infrastructure into the plans for a community and how it grows and whether they provide additional uh, employment opportunities, commercial or retail uh, establishments, or also to build uh, housing, new residential properties to meet the demands of, of the future that uh, offer an opportunity perhaps for more walkability and more density than uh, we see in other areas. So 
We've got some boards, as I mentioned before, uh, that are going to be in the area around the lunchroom where we discuss in more detail station area planning, transit-oriented development, but uh, hopefully this is a, a little introduction and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that any of you had. Thank you. Well, with that, uh, it uh, is now the part of our program where we're going to get to the questions. But before we do that, I think we should thank the panelists one more time and maybe give them a round of applause. Thank you for your time today being part of the panel with us. Uh, I will uh, ask the questions. If you have any further questions, please you know, fill out the cards. Uh, there are people walking uh, in the aisles. They'll be bringing those to me. Um, I will ask the questions as, as, well, as long as I'm able to actually read the, some of the writing. Uh, we've got a, a card over here. Uh, can anybody come and pick that up? No. <laughs> We've got two more cards. Uh, I guess we're not collecting today. You're out of luck. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and start asking the questions, and then as they as they come up, then uh, then I'll I'll get a hold of them. Did you not get a card? Okay. Um, well, if you see uh, Bob. Uh, ask him to give me some more cards. We have one up front that we need. Uh, the first question is going to go to uh, to Paul uh, Grether. Uh, Paul, you mentioned safety and FRA compliance is a key issue um, uh, for integrating freight and passenger rail. As freight and passenger rail lines are being considered for Oasis, how are they going to be FRA compliant, or how will that process work? Well, there's there's a new trend. Um, as a result of an unfortunate incident that happened in Chatsworth, California a few years ago, there's now technology being... Oh, can't hear. Can you hear me now? Can hear you now. Good. <laughs> um, there was a, unfortunately, there was an incident in Chatsworth, California several years ago between a commuter rail train and a freight train that resulted in Congress passing legislation mandating what's called positive train control. Um, so that technology is being rolled out across the country. Um, it'll come to Cincinnati because we have Amtrak service here on the, the main line that Amtrak uses. Um, so there's a lot of new technologies that are coming out that will ensure uh, the safety of uh, passenger and, and freight uh, on, on in, in terms of uh, when they integrate. But while we have you, we've got another question for you. Uh, it says, by using existing infrastructure for Eastern Corridor Rail, is there a chance that the track could bend? Is that, is that possibly a, a Paul and uh, a Richard question that could be answered there? <laughs> Make sure you put the microphone. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I like I said earlier, I think there's uh, there's a lot of uh, safety issues, but um, but those get addressed through uh, through all the different technologies. Now, the other point I wanted to make that's that's very important for um, when you mix uh, freight and passenger is that the folks in, and when you look at surveys of commuter rail passengers around the country, the reason they use these services oftentimes is not so much because they're faster than driving. It's because they're more reliable than driving. Because you know, you know, when, when you get to the train station at five minutes to late, that 802 train is going to run at 802, and it's going to arrive downtown, you know, at uh, at 8:53 or whatever, and you're going to get to work right at nine o'clock, and it's going to do that day after day after day. Unlike driving, where you know there could be an incident, uh, there could be weather, there could be other factors that that create variability in in your travel patterns. And so as we look to integrate uh, freight and passenger, that's kind of a key component into to mixing it, is making sure that the passenger trains are reliable because that's, that's, what, drives, that's what drives the ridership, is, is the service reliability. And just to add on what Paul said, uh, certainly Paul indicated that the existing conditions for the track uh, on the Oasis line uh, varies wildly. And even for freight service, freight does not necessarily need to go fast. And so because they don't go fast, the quality of the track can be uh, reduced over what would be necessary to provide that sort of reliability and the passenger comfort that would be important for any uh, rail transit service. So as part of our engineering for the Oasis line, we would be recommending upgrades to both the track and signaling. I talked about the improvements that would take place at all of the grade crossings. And uh, it's continuous welted track, so it's a very high quality track. There is very minimal vibration. Uh, noise is minimized as well. So important considerations from a community perspective as this new uh, service might be introduced. 
Uh, our next question is for the entire panel, I think. And uh, the question is, how, how can the Eastern Quarter Project help the streetcar to succeed? So integrating, as we're talking about integration today, how can the, the different modes, e the potential oasis and other modes help the streetcar to, to be more viable? Well, certainly from the perspective, as Commissioner Portune indicated, uh, the region made an investment in the Riverfront Transit Center a number of years ago as part of the Port Washington Way uh, street improvements. And so that facility exists, and it's entirely possible that we can integrate the DMU vehicles into that facility with uh, very minimal changes. Uh, we would have some track improvements. We would run track in there. The, the facility is huge. It's very well designed. It's currently uh, used for, uh, for some bus operations, particularly the new Metro Plus service that's operating through there. So there would be an opportunity as the trains come into the RTC to uh, just go upstairs and be able to access the streetcar, and that could provide for that first and last mile trip that is so important in transit if people are in the downtown area it would uh, provide a pedestrian accelerator that they could get on board the streetcar and go a few blocks and maybe walk one or two blocks depending on what, what their ultimate location is. And, and then as we mentioned, an important part of this is working with SORTA on uh, circulators and feeder services to support that. And, and that effort would is just preliminary and, and would be uh, much more detailed as we advance the planning kind of piggyback a comment on there. Just to, um, there's a lot of discussion around the, the, the Riverfront Transit Center, and just to talk about, you know, there's certainly a lot of opportunities built into the design of it for additional service there, um, but it is used today, and it's used not just for the Metro Plus service, but also for a lot of uh, school bus parking and um, uh, motor coach parking during uh, sporting events at the stadiums. So uh, what will be important and where I think uh, the OASIS line will be very helpful is in really facilitating the transit center as not just a uh, commuter facility, but also a special events transit facility, which I think it's very well designed and suited for. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you remember when I, in my remarks, not that my remarks are memorable in any way, but <laughs> uh, we, talked about, we talked about light rail getting voted down. That was a, that was a full out system, right? Um, what we're talking about, I think, is rail transit in pieces. So you have the streetcar, and you have the Oasis line, and you have the transit center. At OKI, you know, we, you know, we'd like to see uh, the streetcar uh, go up to uh, Uptown because that is an employment center, sixty thousand jobs, connected to the central business district. OKI, we're really interested in it going across the river, um, where you bring in the Northern Kentucky Commercial Center. So, um, and by the way, 11% uh, of the people who work in Uptown live in Northern Kentucky. So if you can build a system that connects the three commercial centers, you now have a, you now have a commuter train, if you will. And so then you add the Oasis line, I know Commissioner Portune has a great deal of interest going west um, but everybody, I think, knows that the crown jewel in all of the commercial development when it comes to rail transit is the airport. How do we get there? How do we get people from there to there? And the connecting all this together. So I think we're building this in stages. Hopefully we're building it in stages, and we'll go from there. Um, the next question, are, are the northern counties, Butler and Warren, specifically actively participating in regional transit and freight development? And this is to any of the panelists. I mean, certainly as part of OKI, they definitely are involved in uh, freight development, uh, very active in, um, in our work. Our treasurer of uh, OKI was here today, uh, works for a transit agency. Um, we're there's no way other than say it. Yes, they're very involved. Um, this, uh, this question again is to, to any member of the panel. Uh, has funding source been identified for Eastern Quarter and will it rely heavily on FTA funding for construction? I suspect that might have been planted by some of our FTA <laughs> friends that are here today. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know, I, in part I, could probably, I can answer part of that. I don't know that we necessarily know the answer to that question because we haven't finished the work on the Eastern Quarter completely. Um, but as that becomes 
as we start to move forward. I think we have to plan for you know, any mode of, of, of funding that we can find, including but not limited to FTA funding. But I'll, I'll let, you know, Paul touched on this a little bit in his presentation, but I'll let Paul touch that one now. Well, I think it's important as you go through the, fund, the project development process that you operate in a not to preclude mode. And so it's important to use the federal planning process uh, even if you're not sure, because it's a good process, one, but also because uh, if you're not sure where the funding might come from, you don't want to preclude anything. And um, there's certainly some lessons learned with other projects across the country. Uh, the streetcar project right here in Cincinnati, when it switched from uh, being state and locally funded to being federally and locally funded, required some rework on the planning side to comply with the federal requirements. You don't want to be in that situation. And so uh, with the way the project's moving forward right now, I think it's taking a not to preclude approach, which is the, which is the right way of doing it. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that? Okay. Um, this one is a bit of a tough question. I don't know if the panelists can answer this uh, with, with more than, you know, what, what our opinions are about it. But um, the question is, uh, Governor Kasich refused 400 million federal funds for the 3C rail project. How can a regional rail, how can regional rail integration plan move forward without the Ohio governor on board? Well, I think the, uh, <laughs> that was a curveball. It can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is where you have to, you know, you have to kind of be reasonable, all right? Um, there are many people who uh, like the idea of rail who looked at the 3C plan and said, that's not going to work. Um, it was very easily to pick off politically. But just the way that it was laid out as a project was very difficult to do. Um, there are many people who believe that the project never ever would have been completed, even though it got $400 million from the federal government. So I'm not sure that we can start labeling people against uh, an, a broad concept uh, like rail transit because of one project. And, um, I think that's important that when we get into this, we have to understand we can't get into camps. Uh, we have to realize that, um, you know, there is a commercial aspect to these plans that is critically important to our region competing for the next 40 years in a global economy, as well as their environmental concerns. So. You know, I don't, I, don't see, um, I don't see the governor's opposition to the withdrawal as being a statement in perpetuity, as you say, Paul, that uh, this governor is against this type of rail in, uh, initiative and investment. Anybody else want to touch that? That was very brave, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, it's, it's always easier to go with that. <laughs> Uh, AK Steel uh, was identified today as one of the one of the carriers. How did the uh, Northern American Stainless and Gallatin Steel operations fit into the larger plan from the Port Authority's uh, perspective? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just that they do. <laughs> um, this one is to Mr. Polisinski. Um, uh, with regard to public-private uh, partnerships. Um, outside of the outside of the large class one or two railroads, who is the public and a public-private partnership, and provides examples of what that might look like. The public? Yeah. Who is the public and the public-private partnership? Well, it can be any. The way that we view the public and the public-private partnership is it has to be a governmental unit, obviously. Um, when we did the Norfolk Southern uh, uh, 3P, uh, the the actual um, government unit was the Ohio Rail Development Commission. And so we worked with them. And they were, they were not just a funnel for money. I mean, they have a tremendous amount of expertise and, and they drove the project in many ways along with NS. Um, so it can be a variety of uh, governmental units. Um, when it comes to a larger uh, public-private partnerships, uh, you certainly, when you look at something like the Brent Spence Bridge, not sure all you've heard about the Brent Spence Bridge, but uh, <laughs> if you haven't, um, we can talk after this. But the, uh, in that case, it's going to be the states uh, themselves that are going to be the, the public part. So 
Um, it can be a relatively uh, small but very important <coughs> ORDC all the way up to a state government. Um, uh, will there be an inclusion process for all contractors and subcontractors? If so, what are the uh, percentages for MBEs and SBEs specifically, African Americans, uh, uh, if, not, if not why? And I think that's, that's a question that is yet to be determined because we're not quite to that stage yet, but I'll let the panel take it from there. The only the only thing I can say is with any federal transit or federal railroad administration funded project, the federal government requires a disadvantaged uh, business enterprise program, DBE, um, and the certifications for those are typically handled through ODOT. Right. But since we're in the design phase right now, that's, we're, we're not quite to that, po that point yet, but, but we'll cross that bridge hopefully uh, at, at a later date. Uh, Cincinnati owns a major freight rail line. Does this give us leverage in negotiating for passenger access to other freight lines? <laughs> I had a really good transportation professor years ago who told me the answer to many questions is it depends. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in many transportation questions. So, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of factors at play, um, so it depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all of the lines that we're actually referring to all are, deal with that particular carrier. So you're talking about multiple carriers. So to your point, it does depend. Um, another very good question. Were the railroads invited today? Yes, they were. Um, I can answer that one. Um, yes, they were. G&W is right there uh, in the front. And um, I think we had uh, someone from Norfolk who was, was here earlier. So yes, they were invited. And, um, and what we decided was, from a panelist perspective, is that there's so many different carriers, as to my previous answer, there were so many different, t different carriers and different people involved that if we couldn't have them all up on the stage, then there was really no point in having, having any of them. But they are, you know, participating and, and giving us their, their insight in this. So, uh, next question: uh, Why is there so much emphasis on the Oasis Line in the Eastern Quarter and new development there, when other areas in the regional plan have greater development population and associated congestion issues? Anybody want to touch that one? Sure. Um, because it's a project that's been under development for 20 years. And because there seems to be a great deal of momentum now um, to complete it. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done, but it is the, it's, it is the project that is as close to being completed as there is. Um, so uh, it's heavily studied. You know, Paul said a very nice thing about the federal process. That's his comment, not mine. But the, <laughs> the point is, it just it takes it takes a great deal of time. Um, and when you, I'm just taking from the question that somebody said, if I read it, if I heard it correctly, um, when there are other areas that are more congested, or whatever. Well, the point is, is when you look at investment, it's not what's happening today. It's where the growth in the investment is, the rate of return. And for whatever reason, um, you know, the 71 spine uh, that was put forth in 2002, you know, got whopped at the, the ballot box. Uh, if you look at the Eastern Corridor, you have a lot of wide open land for development. Uh, it is obviously a growing part of the region. Claremont County is, is growing crazily. Uh, it's, this project is supported uh, across the region, supported greatly by Northern Kentucky, because right now if you live um, in Claremont County and you work downtown, you leave Ohio, drive into Kentucky, and go back into Ohio. Uh, so Northern Kentucky, Judge Executive Steve Pendry is the biggest supporter of the uh, Eastern <laughs> Corridor I know, to get people off of 275, off 471 in his county, and keep it in Ohio where it needs to be, according to him. So uh, there are a lot of reasons why the Eastern Corridor is, uh, is advancing and others are not, not the least of which is the closest to possible completion. Thank you, Mark. Um, safety of rail. With increased rail use, how is the public being assured that dangerous freight goods are being regulated and that they're being protected against possible harmful effects? Is Laura? Is that you? 
No one? I mean, that, that's probably more of a federal compliance issue, I think, than a right. regional one. So we'll have to hold off on that one until we get Well, Alan, and, and certainly, you know, there are some existing freight users on the Oasis line, particularly, you know, to serve uh, their, their current customers. But on the majority of, for example, segments one and two that, that pass through uh, the city of Cincinnati's neighborhoods, there would not be any uh, freight uh, service there, so it would be passenger only, if that helps address that, that person's question. Um, next, next question, please clarify the passenger rail will run side by side of the G and W line to Norwood uh, and then combine to one line, all of which is on the Oasis line. I guess that's from the G and W people. They want to make sure we're not going to use all their tracks up, right? So <laughs> Richard, you want to touch that or Paul? Well, I think the, the map that I showed during my presentation was just to illustrate which parts of the railroads that sort of owns. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's where exactly where the uh, passenger rail will go. Okay. Um, the Oasis line in particular would only use a portion of the sort of owned portion of the Oasis line and then would switch onto another railroad to go east. Since we're getting close on time, I'm gonna have to make this the last question. If you have additional questions to the extent that uh, our guests are gonna be sticking around for lunch, perhaps you can, you can talk to them at, at, uh, at lunch and ask your questions further. But the final question is, uh, is this. Is resurrecting the 2002 Metro Moves plan a possible step forward with passenger rail in the region? What would have to change for it to be successful? None of them have been easy today, have they? <laughs> hey, boy, don't fight, guys. Don't fight. Somebody take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there's any doubt that um, aspects of the Metro Moose plan can be brought back, and um, it's you know, we, we, you know, you enter into different eras, and this era may be ending where, um, where people have this in, in just immediate negative reaction to rail transit. Um, you know, we're talking about how uh, uh, people 26 to 36, their, their driving habits are different and things like that. You know, of course. Um, the one thing, though, that, um, you have to remember when you look at all this stuff is you have to look at the financing. Uh, you, I mean, everybody, everybody wants to be riding on that train, sipping green tea, reading a book <laughs> on the way to work. The only problem is how do you pay for it? And we're broke, folks, um, when it comes to the federal government. Um, so how do you put these things together? And that's why new innovative financing mechanisms um, like public-private partnerships, uh, new ways of, of, uh, of putting the technology and building supplies and things like this, all this can come together. But at the end of the day, it's how do you pay for these things? And that is more of a question today than it was 10 years ago in 2002, right? Because we're worse off when it comes to the amount of public financing for these <coughs> projects. Um, so if you really, if you really want to be in, if you really want to do something about this, you have to look at how transportation's funded in this country. And people talk about increasing the user fee on gasoline or vehicle miles traveled and things like that. All those are band-aids, okay? What we have to do is we have to look at our federal budget and say the amount of money that's going to transportation infrastructure has to change in, as it is ingrained in the budget. It has to increase. Whether, and how that happens, you have to take it from other places. It's spending money that is already being spent by the federal government in another place. There's no political solution that's going to generate, okay, that amount of money by simply saying, uh, oh, well, we'll have a VMT tax. Privacy groups hate the VMT tax. Gasoline tax is dead, not only from Congress, but from the White House. So what we have to do is we have to figure out, okay, how do we, how do we put this together in a totally different way of how we view 
transportation and its relationship to our economy. So anyway, yeah, a long-winded answer, but that's how you get Metro moves uh, to become a reality. Thanks, Mark. And thank the, I'd like to again thank the panelists for participating today, and I'd also like to thank all of you for the great questions. And with that, I think we'll adjourn to lunch at this point, right? Yeah.